Good morning, good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you're listening from. My name is Kerstin Danner and I work for Ask for Water GmbH. Before I start this presentation on Stop the Rot, I'd like to express my sincere thanks to the Waterloo Foundation who funded this study and enabled it to happen. And also I thank the members of the reference group that was set up along with many others who reviewed the document, provided inputs and photographs, and those who gave me time for interviews. This study is focused on the countries presented in colour in the map, which is basically Sub-Saharan Africa plus Sudan. Over 30 years have passed since the UN water decade of the 1980s, and in that time there's been tremendous progress in the figure on the right, it shows the changes in rural and urban access to drinking water supplies in sub-Saharan Africa. And if you combine the blues, the greens and the yellows, which are improved sources, you can see that they've increased considerably in the 20 years since 2000. But you can also see that the rural areas are lagging behind the urban areas and the overall progress seems to be slowing down reaching those who so far have been left behind and used unimproved sources or surface water remains a major challenge, particularly in rural areas. So how important is groundwater to this part of the world? Well, in Sub-Saharan Africa, groundwater is extremely important. The map shows the proportions of the population that rely on groundwater point sources as their main drinking water supplies. And that's taken from recent survey data that's collated by the Joint Monitoring Programme, the GMP. You can see that this figure actually only refers to, refers to point water sources, which means springs, wells and tube wells or boreholes. And there's a lack of comprehensive data on the extent to which groundwater is the source for pipe supplies but at least 50% of the population of these countries overall rely on groundwater point sources. And then stepping away from that and focusing specifically on boreholes and wells that have been protected. Um, so a bit of a different picture. Um, this is a map showing the percentage of the rural population relying on those two types of sources, which are protected improved sources. And you can see in some countries, for example, Malawi, it's as high as 79%. Zambia, Zimbabwe, Uganda, South Sudan, <clears throat> Guinea, Burkina Faso, they're all above 50%, Liberia as well. So you've got a lot of countries with high dependency on boreholes and protected wells. And that brings me on to talk about the role of hand pumps specifically. And for the last three to four decades, the borehole or the protected well that's been installed with a hand pump has played a really significant role in improving drinking water access in sub-Saharan Africa. And hand pumps do provide a viable alternative to contaminated surface water, to open wells like the one you can see in the picture here, even as in the case of community water supplies or community hand pumps, the water does still generally need to be carried to the home unless the hand pump is, is at the home or, or in the compound. Three of the most important hand pumps used in sub-Saharan sub Africa are shown here. The India Mark II on the left, which was, as the name suggests, actually initially developed in India. The Afridev in the middle, which started to, de to develop later than the India Mark II in, in Malawi. And the Zimbabwe bush pump which was initially developed in the 1920s and has been modified over time since then. And these three pumps are all public domain pumps, which means that there are international standards available in the public domain and that anyone essentially has, the, the authority can manufacture these pumps. In the first report of my Stop the Rot trilogy, I kind of show which countries the India Mark II and Afridev are predominantly used. You can see the pictures here on, on the, um, the slide. And the bush pump is used almost exclusively in Zimbabwe. So how many people rely on hand pumps in sub-Saharan Africa? Well, from my analysis of the GMP data, I estimate that hand pumps are used 
by about one in five of the population or 200 million people. And that spread kind of unevenly across the, the subcontinent, as you can see from the map here. And based on a number of assumptions, which are detailed in my report, I estimate that there are something between 0.5 and 1.3 million hand pumps in use in sub-Saharan Africa, with the most likely number about 700,000. 700,000 pumps, there you go. If wells and boreholes are properly designed, constructed, the wells properly developed, they're properly installed, their lifetime should exceed 25 years. And then when it comes to the pump that you install in the well, the India Mark II and the Afridev have both been designed, and the bush pump, they've both been designed so that the wearing parts can be replaced. And let's say over a 10 year period, every part should actually be replaced. But pumps do stop working earlier and they can also perform poorly. And the figure on the right shows data collected from a sample of boreholes in Ethiopia on the proportion of boreholes that are working in blue or not working with no flow in yellow. And this is from a really instrumental piece of research um, called the Hidden Crisis Project that was undertaken by the British Geological Survey with partners and was funded by the British government. And what's so interesting about this is here you can see working, not working, blue, yellow. And then you can see, well, actually, there's a bit more to it than that. So a pump might be working, but its flow, its yield might not be very good. And that's the green here. So working, but there's really not that much water coming out. And then if you look even further with the two donuts at the bottom, they may, be, they may not be reliable. You've got other colours in there kind of chipping away at the, the dark blue. They may not have good water quality. There's a whole set of issues. So what was a very simple working, not working, is actually a much more complex picture. And you, if you look at the donut in the bottom right, you can see the working is actually about a quarter of the sources are working properly because the rest all have something wrong with them. Poor yield, unreliable, water quality issues. So this working, not working, doesn't really tell us the whole story. And that's kind of quite important. I mean, there's a lot of, of great work that's been done with the Hidden Crisis Project and really take a look at it um, if you can. But essentially, a hand pump breaks down for a very specific technical reason, like the break of the chain, the riser pipe breaks or an O-ring fails. But its repair depends on the ability of the community or the owners to raise funds, organise a mechanic, source spare parts. And in turn, these aspects depend on other factors within the locally, within the locality and, and in the country. So it's quite complicated, um, actually. What seems to be a very simple technology has a number of issues behind it. And also what's very important to point out is that the main point is that when a hand pump fails, the users are forced to use other, often unprotected sources. And a poorly operating pump can cause conflicts, increase waiting times and cause all sorts of issues for the community. One of the striking aspects of water point failure is that many points fail. In fact, too many points fail in the first year or two. And myself and others call this premature failure. And this premature failure was one of the drivers for UNICEF and WaterAid to strive to improve the quality of their drilling programmes. In the figure on the right, which shows data from Nigeria, it has been estimated that the probability of failure in the first year can be 35% or even more. And I argue that when something like premature failure takes place, most likely something was technically wrong with the borehole or the pump in the first place. Corrosion is the attack of the surface of materials by chemical process. And it affects concrete, glass, plastic, as well as the materials that contain iron. In the 1980s and into the early 1990s, it was concluded that the total iron concentration in natural groundwater 
is actually rarely greater than one milligram per litre. And in fact, when you see this red water coming out of a hand pump source, the iron that you see <clears throat> is usually caused by corrosion. Corrosion is usually the cause of the red water or the iron problem in hand pumped equipped wells. And the third point is that galvanisation doesn't actually protect rising mains or pump rods from corrosion under the prevailing groundwater conditions in areas where the pH, <clears throat> excuse me, in areas where the pH is less than 6.5. And finally, the last point is that the less that a corrosion affected hand pump is actually used, the more serious the iron problem becomes. And all of these observations that were made in the 1980s, 1990s still hold true. And sadly, it still happens. And what I've done with, with, with the second report of the Stop for the Rock Trilogy is try to document cases where there still is rapid corrosion taking place, as well as cases where it took place in the past and may have been sorted out. And we talked about abandonment before. When hand pumps corrode rapidly, the sources are often abandoned because of the taste, because of the colour, and because they're essentially wearing away, they're corroding quickly, they're prone to very frequent breakdown and failure. So although this problem has been known about since the 1980s, and there have been some action taken in some countries, Uganda is an example, Ghana is an example, Gambia is an example, um, it's actually still taking place in over 20 countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and you can read more about in my, my second report. My third report in the Stop the Rot series looks at another issue. So moving away from rapid corrosion of, of hand pump components, it's looking at quality. And what I've done is I've pulled together specific concerns about hand pump components that have been observed, measured from many countries. And the kinds of problems that we see are components being too light. They're not the right weight, so they're, they're not following specifications, actually. Non-standard material composition, so stainless steel that actually isn't stainless steel or it doesn't um, adhere to any of the international standards. Thin galvanisation, so the galvanising coating um, on GI, GI pipes or... or, or um, pump rods just being too thin, dimensions that don't conform, materials that are defective, parts that are not genuine, and a lack of durability, specifically around seals. And all of these can lead to premature failure of the hand pump. And I mentioned premature failure earlier. Now, there are other technical quality concerns apart from the hand pump. Um, this work is specifically looking at the hand pumps. Um, but poor hand pump performance can result from other issues. Um, siting and drilling are, are part of it. There can be installation problems um, if the pump isn't installed properly, if the well hasn't been developed properly. So in short, um, what seems like a simple pair of technologies, the borehole and the hand pump or the protected well and the hand pump, um, a technology that provides almost one in five people in sub-Saharan Africa with their main drinking water supplies, those pair, that pair of technologies actually requires a lot of skill and professionalism in order to perform well. So I'm kind of coming towards the end of the presentation, you'll be very pleased to know, so just bear with me for the next couple of slides. Um, this is another aspect that I look, looked at, which is the hand pump supply chain. And I looked at Zambia um, to provide a case study of how these hand pump supply chains work. And basically what you have, if you look at the, the left of this um, diagram, you have hand pump manufacturers, hand pump assemblers, traders and retailers, mainly in India who provide, assemble, pull together the, the, these hand pumps, um, manufacture, coming into Zambia. So you have 
multiple manufacturers and sellers from India selling to multiple buyers and multiple retailers in Zambia. So you have private retailers, local authority, spares depots where they exist and an NGO, in this case called the Purple NGO One, um, may contract a local partner organisation, for example, a drilling company, for, sorry, for example, a local NGO, to work with a drilling contractor. And that drilling contractor will buy in country or may buy directly from, um, from India. And likewise, your communities or your individuals will buy from hand pump mechanics who are buying from private suppliers, local authorities who are buying from India. So what's the big deal? Well, it's quite a complex supply chain. You have multiple buyers in country, multiple retailers in country, multiple manufacturers and sellers from India, and in essence, practically no regulation of what's coming in and what's moving through the country. And it's also very difficult, difficult to securely track which goods are coming from where and how they're moving. So it's, it's a supply chain where it's quite difficult to assure quality. Um, and this is not just an issue for Zambia, this is an issue for many countries. And I hope in this discussion um, that we're going to be hearing about what you're doing about that supply chain. So when we talk about components that are not of st adequate standard, we see that the supply chain and lack of controls in the supply chain could be part of that problem. Um, and quality control. So, so, so if quality control, you, any organisation bringing um, equipment in should be making sure that there's internal quality control at the manufacturer, that there's some kind of external quality control, quality assurance, pre-delivery inspection by an inspection agency. And that these goods that are come into the country are inspected, they're inspected upon delivery. It's also important to, to ensure that suppliers are pre-qualified, so that suppliers really are bona fide suppliers. And another key aspect is that purchase orders are absolutely clearly defined. And all this has been developed many years ago in, in the kind of guidance for, for quality assurance for the AFRIDEF that you can find online. And one of the challenges that, that we realised is that a number of organisations are doing very little. And this is the, the pie chart here that the donut is from an RWSN survey. And we found that 33% of the organisations who were involved in bringing hand pumps into the country basically didn't have procedures in place um, to quality assure those components. So back to corrosion. Great picture here, thanks to, to WaterAid Uganda. Um, corrosion has been known about for over 30 years, this rapid corrosion of hand pumps, and yet simple mistakes are being repeated again and again. Galvanised iron pumps and riser pipes continue to be installed in unsuitably aggressive groundwater. Pump and pipe materials, including GI, stainless steel, Brass are not always meeting quality standards and are not always being checked routinely. And pump manufacturers and installers are not always incentivized to deliver good quality, unfortunately. So what's needed? Well, there's a, a group of organizations, the reference group, a number of people and new people forming an action group around this. Stop the Rot Action Group being the nickname at the moment. And really trying to call to action, you know, governments to, to regulate imports, for there to be stronger feedback me mechanisms where there are problems, to really introduce proper asset management that makes sure that um, assets are not just put in the ground but, but are managed over time. Funding agencies, you know, we're calling out to, to, for, for them to, to raise awareness of this ongoing rapid hand pump corrosion problem and to consider funding a process to map areas that have these low pH, which, which causes um, rapid corrosion when you install gal galvanized iron pipes or, or um, pump rods, to encourage research on, on hand pump service life. And then for implementing and service organizations, you know, really 
consider also end of life corrosion because eventually a pump all the components that need to be replaced collect data on reasons for failure from rehabilitation programs or maintenance programs really let's start looking at why pumps are, are failing technically why and document what's being done to reduce or to mitigate this rapid corrosion issue so we're done you'll be very happy to know and um thank you very much for listening and if you want more information you can get it through this url